had my money and tell you what I'd do. I would go downtown and buy a micro too, cause I'm crazy about a micro. Yes, yeah, I'm crazy about a micro for. I'm gonna buy a micro and cruise up and down the road. The whole time I was driving 70s luxury cars, people were trying to talk me out of it. Why can't you own one of these money pits when you're older, when you can afford it, they asked. Well, I've grown up a bit and I don't drive them anymore, so I'll tell you. No way would I ever buy a 1973 Mercury Marquis as a responsible adult. A responsible adult doesn't buy, in the 21st century, a 6,000 pound, 19 and a half foot long sedan that gets 9 miles to the gallon. But I wasn't always a responsible adult, it's very debatable whether I qualify as one now. And I surely did own one of these ancient and venerable beasts of the American byway before I was quite as settled as I am now. In the summer I turned 21, one of my best friends and I took this ridiculous car in a 4,167 mile loop of the western U.S., chaining together as many scenic destinations, roadside oddities, and unusual route choices as we could into one continuous journey. That's the trip I'll be relating to you for the duration of this slideshow. Pretty antiquated, the slideshow, but these pictures are all the visual proof of the trip I've got, and if we took this trip in a 40-year-old car, then by God, I'll tell it to you in a 40-year-old manner. Deciding to take a vehicle older than yourself on a long road trip is, firstly, a matter of great faith. With a car that old, at the price someone who works as a line cook for a Panera Bread outlet could afford, you just have no way of knowing where that car has been or what it's seen. I bought the giant old bastard for $1,500 from an older couple in Palm Springs who had named it Sizzle. They had no idea of the car's history. The only lasting legacy of the hands that had passed through being a laminated sticker on the dashboard showcasing boating safety rules. A pretty funny joke, actually. And a less forgivable amateur electrical rewiring job that shorted out the entire car a couple months into ownership. You've got to be several kinds of stupid to want a car like that. I was all those kinds and more. I love this car with everything I had it in me to love a lifeless thing. For a cheap, fat old Mercury like this, it isn't a matter of if it'll betray you, it's when. But the calculations of the heart that overtake the kind of person predisposed to love these heaps doesn't let that be the end of the argument. It's not about having something you know you can depend on. It's about trying to rest from the dying thing as much joy as possible before the scraping of chafed metal grinds your dreams to a halt. Me and my friend Jed, we had ambitions to do exactly that. Everyone told us it was stupid. Everyone was exactly right. But we didn't care. This was a matter of faith. I mean, how many years did this car have left in the world? And what purpose those years if it can't sail gracefully down the infinitely winding miles of the American road? Faith alone is rarely enough to accomplish anything in the real world, of course, so it's little surprise that Jed and I caught a lucky break on the practical side of things as well. We had planned the trip for August, after summer semester was over at the community college Jed and I were going to at the time. I was taking Automotive 100 for the first time, and Jed needed to retake it for a better grade. Not because Jed didn't know what he was up to, he's one of the most mechanically clever people I've ever met in my entire life, but because neither of us would have been at the college if we had had very much respect for the administrative procedures of education. So we both found ourselves in Auto 100 together. A class that comes with a workshop period where we can use the full shop facilities of the college, and since Jed had done much better in his more advanced auto classes and knew the instructor already, he could pretty much do whatever he wanted during that period. Which for both of us meant spending a couple hours every afternoon that summer fixing up minor issues on the Mercury, performing compression tests, trying to make sure it wouldn't flat out explode halfway through Oregon, and here we are, unexploded, a fact to which I give full credit to Jed. When the class was over, Jed got his better grade, and I got a relatively stable Mercury. And for heavily used cars of that age, relatively stable is about as high as you can aim mechanically. You're never going to be able to diagnose every clank and wheeze. These cars want to die. Every mile holds some unique complaint. But like many cranky old men, it's a false pretense. To actually move these cars along the road, foot held steady against the dusty pedal, they sing the same song of adventure that they always have. There's such pleasure in stealing these thrills from a lost era before the junkyard can't wait, it almost justifies the fact that any money you put into them is money that you will never see again. The 1973 Mercury Marquis certainly didn't start life as a shit heap, though, that much is clear. Mercury, as a make, was supposed to be a bridge between Ford's entry-level and working-class offerings and Lincoln's ultra-high-end models. The Mercury Cougar, for example, is a luxury version of the Ford Mustang, while the Mercury Marquis is a slightly downgraded version of the Lincoln Continental. But in trying to design for the ambitions of the middle class, the 73 Marquis has many stylistic choices that make it unique, even among other luxury sedans of the era. 
It's got dozens of high-class refinements like embroidered leather seats, a laurel leaf wrapped hood ornament, and vacuum powered headlight covers. But where a high-class Lincoln would use flowing lines to emphasize a look of power and prestige, the Marquis orients itself around a much boxier, aggressive, masculine aesthetic, like with its whole front waffle iron grille. For a car so committed to making you feel fancy, it still looks like a pretty serious road machine. Ours didn't la look quite so well preserved, though. I don't regret much in my life, but I do regret the night I was doing donuts on a soccer field with it at about three in the morning, and I slammed into a tree at like five miles an hour. Well, I regret the damage done. For while it lasted, the sensation of making a 6,000 pound car dance in the moonlight, first geared donuts uncoiling across the soft wet grass, the sheer thrill of such a very strange kind of jackassery, it complicates it. It was wrong, obviously, to have done such a thing, wrong to tear up a municipal soccer field like that, wrong to accidentally but not unexpectedly slide such a beautiful machine nose first into a tree as I was coming out of a figure eight. Wrong to lie about the incident to the authorities and to my family, but when I'm on my deathbed, will I actually hold any regret for that stolen thrill? No mechanical damage was done, so we pounded out the front clip as well as we could and stuck the nearest fit bumper we could find on it. And after visiting every pick-apart yard in San Diego, Riverside, and Los Angeles, the best we could find was from a 77 Lincoln Continental. The fit is hardly perfect, it sticks out like a steel underbite, but it is road legal, and I'll be damned if it doesn't give the car a little extra character. When I wasn't working with Jed on the Marquis, I was doing research for the trip. I got a stack of books, real books, like the National Geographic Guide to Scenic Byways or the New Roadside America, and travelogues like William Lee Steed Moon's classic of American travel, Blue Highways. I had done trips like this before, but I wanted this to be as classic an American road trip as possible. No freeways, if I could help it. No hotels. No GPS. A stack of AAA maps and a fat National Geographic atlas of the U.S. I had about 800 bucks, and so did Jed, and we figured gas was probably going to be around $1,200, so it left it a little tight for two weeks on the road, but not unmanageable. When you bring an RV on a road trip, you're taking a whole house with you. Taking a 70s land yacht like we were is like taking just the living room. We were bringing two overstuffed leather couches with us just by selecting the car that we did. As the days wound down to the trip, we were beyond impatient, and not completely free of worry. Reasonable, practical worries that disappeared like smoke out an open window as the day arrived that we were to set sail up towards Los Angeles, where we would connect with California Route 1, a two-lane byway that follows the extreme edge of the California coast. Los Angeles is like a biome onto itself. North of San Diego, on the I-5, you pass through the Camp Pendleton Marine Base, much of which is undeveloped. So you have a nice half an hour or so of low rolling hills of Southern California coast, past the San Onofre nuclear plant, before the inconceivably vast sprawl of the greater LA area starts to unfold. Once it starts, however, it does not stop for 105 miles, over 100 fucking miles without a break in the endless fields of strip malls, cheap weather-beaten apartments, and fast food restaurants. We weren't going the whole 100 mile stretch through northbound I-5 this time, thank God. We only had to get about midway through Los Angeles before taking the very westernmost stretch of Interstate 10 towards Santa Monica. There, we hooked into California Route 1, byway we would be following almost the entire length of. The only part of the one we skipped was the portion that goes deeper into LA before petering out entirely. Route 1 is world famous as one of the most beautiful roads on Earth, and not in a my burgers are world famous kind of way, a artists and scholars from around the world agree kind of way. But this early portion in Los Angeles hasn't quite warmed up to that standard yet. You begin the northbound one by going through LA's most famous beach community, Malibu. To call Malibu a neighborhood is slightly disingenuous. The majority of Malibu is a strip of extremely expensive but relatively small house lots just one property deep along the gorgeous Malibu beach. It's miles of multi-million dollar two or three bedroom houses, many of them done in very modern architectural styles, in one long chain. The cliffs of the rest of America to the east and their ordinance limited opulence to the west. At times, the chain will break for a bit, and you'll crest a hill and see the golden sand stretching off into the distance. It's a tremendous natural beauty, but one that's already been fully commodified. You get north of Malibu, though, and the state owns the property. Here is where you really get to see the beach properly. When people talk about how grand and gorgeous the beaches of Southern California are, it's these sorts of beaches they're talking about. Soft, velvet, delicate beige sand gracefully descending into a warm and infinite ocean with the cliffs behind illuminated by the sun, changing colors by the hour, 
Every good thing you've heard about them is true. I wouldn't recommend living in Southern California if you're poor, because you'll rarely get near the damn coast. But if it takes you your every last dime, I'd recommend seeing the natural splendor of the California coast before you die. The pleasures of being alive seem much more vivid, with the salty warm breeze whipping through your car as you round one gentle curve after another on the western edge of the continent. At the Mugu Lagoon, you detour briefly into Oxnard and then hook into US Route 101, the more commuter-oriented byway going north-south along the coast. If you take the 101 instead of the 1 between San Francisco and Los Angeles, you'll shave around six hours off your trip. That wasn't our plan, but the routes share the same road from Oxnard up until about 20 minutes north of Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara's a great town, quite unique in many ways, but Jed and I are from Southern California already. We're holding down the gas pedal until we see shit we've never seen before. Once Route 1 breaks off the 101 again, it stays inland for the most part as it winds toward Morro Bay. The inland journey is remarkably soothing, especially on a day of alternating clarity and gray cloud cover like we had for it. The hills are so smooth and short, giving the landscape a gentle golden roll, covered in dry grasses that look like felt from the road, like if you reached out to touch it, it would feel like an Ikea couch. Pleasant, but cheap. After L.A., the sparsity of development is a welcome change. Towns feel tucked into the hills, unobtrusive, settlements that sit on top of the landscape, not replace it entirely. When you hit the coast again at Morro Bay, you're confronted by Morro Rock, a giant stone mound lurking in the ocean like a fossilized lighthouse. It's a dramatic thing in such a soft landscape. North from there, we head towards our first actual destination, the Hearst Castle at San Simeon. We arrive much too late for tours, so we try to find camping, but it's too late for that as well. So we head back to a scenic turnout to discuss our options. Well, says Jed, suppose we park in front of the sign that says no camping and claim to have missed it in the dark. That's clever enough for me, so we start our first night of car camping on the road with what would become our nightly routine, getting roaring drunk and listening to AM radio. We traded a bottle of Don Julio and listened to the opinionated voices come in over the airwaves until we were ready to pass out. And when we woke up, we would see the most opulent personal residence ever built in the United States. I'm the kind of person who wakes up immediately when the alcohol leaves my system, as if my liver were so proud of the work that it had just done that it fucking has to wake me right up and tell me about it. It's so around 8 in the morning, I sit bolt upright in a place 375 miles away from where I was yesterday. When you're trying to pull off a road trip on as tight a budget as we were, you have to scavenge to accomplish your routines. About a quarter mile away, I spot a public restroom, a little brown brick hut off the side of the road, and I brush my teeth in the drinking fountain outside. Walking back, I notice Jed got his own wake-up call. A patrolman is parked behind the Mercury, and the officer is doing his best to make an extremely sleepy person feel civically irresponsible. It's not awful, usually, interacting with police on the road, so after his finger-wagging, we get a $45 ticket for camping in a no-camping zone. That is at least 20 bucks cheaper than the Motel 6, Jed points out, so now that we're both awake, we fire up the marquee and meander over to the visitor center for Hearst Castle. We took this trip a couple of years before the phrase 1% came into vogue, but the kind of wealth that early 20th century media baron William Randolph Hearst had defies even that label. Hearst wasn't part of the 1%. He was part of the 0.01%. His life was the inspiration for the film Citizen Kane. His editorial control over the news world meant that most of what Americans learned about the country in those days was relayed through his perspective. He made movies. He knew anybody who was influential, though a few men in the history of Western culture have been quite as influential as Hearst himself. Hearst was a cutthroat businessman, a manipulator of media and of the political process of the United States. But he was also a man whose visions of grandeur, despite how few people would ever see the benefits of that grandeur, are impossible to resist. Hearst didn't just replicate the castles of Europe, the symbols of nobility and authority from the old world. He sent crews to purchase, disassemble, and ship back whole original examples of European design and architecture. Many rooms in Hearst Castle are reconstructed entirely from buildings that are many hundreds of years old, torn down and shipped halfway across the world for the pleasure of a moneyed American. Having two pools, one indoor and one outdoor, in the style of the ancient Greeks and Romans was not enough. He purchased thousands of year old antiquities from those lost civilizations, incorporating them directly into structures he was building. One of the first pieces of statuary that would greet guests arriving at the castle was done in the style of the ancient Egyptians. It nails the style really well, but that's to be expected considering that it's part genuine article. These are 4,000 year old statues that the fountain was built around, making a blended whole. 
To understand how American money changed the world as the 20th century opened, look no farther than Hearst Castle. What better representation of the fading away of traditional notions of royalty than to have history disassembled and then reassembled at the convenience of the American rich? Even more than what Hearst bought is how Hearst ran it. He invited artists, movie stars, brilliant academics, winning politicians, and world-class athletes to all hang out together in this Eden of cash. During the day, they were free to amuse themselves at his private zoo, indoor bowling alley, indoor movie theater, vast library, or any manner of amusement available at the time, including some technological advancements far ahead of what was widely available at the time. At dinner, they would all share stories, ideas, and laughter. The longer you stayed, the further away from Hearst at the table you were seated. When you got to the other end of the table from Hearst, your stay was over. It's easy to look at Hearst Castle, see the excess, the impossible, exuberant excess, and frown at it. But the seduction of the place is irresistible. You cannot visit its grounds and not daydream long hours about how wonderful it must have been to visit in its heyday. It's a beautiful dream, the Gatsby estate made real, but without the collapse of that fictional counterpart, Hearst Castle never failed like the Gatsby estate did. The world moved on, and now it's a museum. In today's America, we have no Hearsts. Jackie and David Siegel, famous for attempting to build the largest residence in America, are building a third-rate knockoff Versailles. They have no vision, not like Hearsts, no real weight as cultural figures, not like Hearst, nothing to mitigate their greed and their entitlement. Who among the extreme rich do we as a country admire these days? Bill Gates, because of his philanthropy and his cleverness? Donald Trump, because of his celebrity and loudness of opinion? None of them, not one, gets it done like Hearst got it done. Maybe it's not that Americans have turned on the wealthy. Maybe it's that the dreams of the wealthy no longer inspire those that they step upon in order to achieve those dreams. From the bus ride up the long, winding road to the castle, through its cavernous yet vibrant spaces, to the miles of gorgeous, primal California coast stretching in every direction, Hearst Castle is a complicated thing to behold. It is beautiful. It is disgusting. It is a celebration of life and leisure built at the expense of the struggling thousands who would never experience even a fraction of its splendor. It is both a triumphant human achievement and an expression of deepest venality. At once. It doesn't get much more American than that. If Hearst Castle is a monument to the power of one man to change the face of the California landscape, the stretch of road we are about to travel is a monument to the power of many men working toward a common good the engineering marvels produced by the public work projects of the early 20th century. Prior to its completion in 1937, the area we were about to pass through, Big Sur, was the most remote and uninhabited in all of California. To drive all the way from San Diego to Seattle along the coast, as we plan to mostly do, you get to see the landscape begin to change with a gradual confidence as you head north. But after San Simeon, where Hearst Castle is, a dramatic shift takes place. The land begins to jut upward, cutting a sharp and steep cliff face against the ocean, much too thin for any sort of development. But with enough concrete, dynamite, and money, it was just wide enough for a road. The road was constructed with the land's natural beauty in mind, and some of the most restrictive land use ordinances in the entire country have kept it completely free of advertising, corporate development, and even so far as to have restricted nearly all residential development. Not that you'd find much room to fit that shit in anyway. If you're traveling southbound, who's ever in the passenger seat will be able to look, look out their window and see nothing but ocean. The road sits so close to the absolute edge of the land itself. The periodic developments you do see are all made with natural materials and an unassuming architectural style. They enhance the feeling of graceful harmony with the landscape that the swooping curves of the road ingrain. Art flourishes in Big Sur, with galleries and sculpture gardens popping up whenever the grade of coastal mountains permit. Some of the art is good, some is a little harder to find meaning in. But looking with your eyeballs is typically free, and I'm always more receptive to artistic messages when I'm not being charged anything. Jid and I once went nine-pin bowling using old CRT monitors like these, and I'm afraid I found that experience more emotionally moving than this electric Jesus, but I can certainly say that I got my money's worth of artistic value from it. The cliffs get higher and higher until you reach the Bixby Creek Bridge, soon after which you begin to descend again. The Bixby Creek Bridge is a truly gorgeous piece of engineering. Later on that day we would cross the Golden Gate, but it's the Bixby Creek Bridge that stays with me as the coast's most beautiful span. 
It nestles into the hills like an Art Deco aqueduct, effortless and timeless in its grace. It's an aesthetic of design that's gotten lost in the shifting of values over the past few decades. To have a recognizable style is typically more important today than the unassuming naturalism of the WPA era. Big Sur isn't much of a landscape for ego, though, so it fits. Even Jack Kerouac, inventor of the American hipster and author of the seminal road memoir On the Road, would write a book about coming here to escape the expectations that people put on him when On the Road transcended memoir to become a contracultural phenomenon. That book, flatly titled Big Sur, is almost the antithesis of the novel of his, of his youth. Kerouac is broken, so broken, drunk, and tired, and so he flees to this remote but beautiful place to confront his failings and pull himself together. He even runs into Neil Cassidy, his traveling companion from On the Road, who works locally changing tires. Cassidy has none of Kerouac's misery, Kerouac's burden of fame and sentiment, and Cassidy's spirit of life still runs strong where Kerouac's has nearly been snuffed out. When you read On the Road, everybody wants to be Kerouac. They want to burn down their youth like he did. But Cassidy was there too, in a quieter way, and his manner of absolute earnest thrill for living. Cassidy's not just in Kerouac's book, either. He's the bus driver in Tom Wolfe's The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, one of the groundbreaking books about the hippie movement. Cassidy was living life to the fullest every minute of his short years on Earth, and in a thoroughly straightforward way. He wrote no books, recorded no albums, yet he left his footprint on generations of travelers, artists, and fuck-ups alike, in such a bombastic manner that he pops up in the artistic works of others time and time again. But everyone wants to be Kerouac. I'm telling you, you read Big Sur, you make the drive out to this still wild landscape, you'll see that for all the blistering and savage ferocity of emotion that Kerouac can muster, it's just so much goddamn human noise in the face of the endless exchange of waves and rock. Kerouac came here to remind himself how to be a real person again, years after On the Road made him an icon. It's a humbling place. Big Sur ends at Carmel in Monterey, where you get back down to sea level and the inland opens up enough to allow a string of towns to pop up, the greatest of which is Santa Cruz, a fantastic college town that we had no intention of stopping in whatsoever. Town tourism is for those with money. You walk around, you get lunch somewhere fun, you poke your nose into the shops, but it all hinges on having cash to burn, or at least the impression of having cash to burn. We didn't have much money, and we didn't have much time, so the kind of boutique tourism the area is famous for just wasn't going to happen, and frankly, good riddance. While I do love eating in weird places, if I go my entire life without seeing another decorative turquoise dream catcher, I will be a happy man. Compared to what we had been passing through all day, Santa Cruz was an enormous town, but we were only a couple hours drive away from the next major metropolis on our trip, San Francisco. The drive glides along low coastal cliffs with tiny lagoons and inlets crossing the road time and time again. It's one of the gentler portions of the one, but it's also one of the most heavily used. A lot of people need to get between San Francisco and Santa Cruz, and this is one of the only routes they can do it on. So if you meander through too slowly, expect to get some local commuters mightily pissed. It's too bad, though, it being such a beautiful road, but if you do anything enough times, it becomes a chore, and California Route 1 is no exception. About 45 minutes south of San Francisco, just before Half Moon Bay, Jed and I saw something very promising. A hay maze. How often do you see a bona fide hay maze? Such a folksy treat wasn't going to be something we would pass up, so we turned off the highway at the giant metal gorilla, paid our nine dollars, and threw ourselves into the labyrinth. This place, the Arata Pumpkin Farm, went all out with the hay maze. It's two acres, and it took Jed and I a full 45 minutes to solve. It's not only a perfect break from driving, it's a fascinating experience. When was the last time you deliberately went into an environment designed specifically to confuse, disorient, and frustrate you? Besides your State Department of Motor Vehicles. For all the mazes I've seen in video games, it's an interesting and slightly anxious sensation to run one yourself and in person, especially one designed with such an impeccable blend of cleverness and whimsy as the hay maze at Arata. It's the best sort of roadside attraction, one that provides road relief and twists your brain around at the same time. Continuing north, dramatic cliffs frame the road as you round the western face of the peninsula San Francisco sits at the head of. City tourism is even more expensive than town tourism, and for the newly 21, the city represents a particular danger to the wallet. So we headed on through. The city's character is so strong that you can get a good impression of it just cruising by, though. San Francisco's iconic rows of turn-of-the-century houses and storefronts looking charismatic but tired in the late summer sun. 
Route 1 very briefly merges with US 101 again to cross the Golden Gate Bridge at the tip of the peninsula. And this thing, this bridge, truly is every bit the engineering marvel it's portrayed to be on television. But much grander and more impressive in person, because the television can't convey its sense of age. When it passed over, this bridge was 72 years old. Each day of its existence had seen physical stress and forces of erosion greater than most anything in nature short of rivers and volcanoes would regularly be subjected to. And yet it appears more delicate than anything nature would ever produce on this sort of scale. Crews have to work year round to keep the bridge alive. And year after year it stood. The modern world is so damn new compared to the whole length of human history, and something like the Golden Gate really brings home the tenuous dominance we have over the Earth. I truly believe in the beauty of American cities like San Francisco, but only a fool would believe in their permanence. I'm grateful to have hit such a rare moment in the world's history that allows me to drive such a car as the Mercury over such a tremendous achievement of engineering and craft as the Golden Gate. I hope these things endure, but I know that they won't. Route 1 splits off again pretty quickly once you pass the Golden Gate. US 101 winds inland, while Route 1 goes back up and over the coastal mountains towards the aggressively twisting coastline. I think that this is the most beautiful stretch of the entire highway. You'll pass under low-hanging tree canopies that gently roof the road, casting dappled shadows all over you as you pass under them. The countryside is a riot of life, thick, healthy green growths punctuated by wildflowers, small pockets of unassuming wooden buildings popping out from underneath. The road itself twists more fiercely than anywhere else along its length, cutting a wild seesaw down the mountain to the cliff face where it swings north again, a hundred feet above the ocean, switchbacking you down towards the picturesque Bolinas Bay. The road then goes inland for a long stretch toward Bodega Bay. Here it passes along through an area that looks shockingly pastoral after the dramatic sea views you've been having. Easy hills with small farms and honest-to-god classic red barns with one or two stoplight towns at lazy intervals, and stretches of straight road long enough to get back to a nice 55 mile an hour cruise, especially satisfying after hours of 25 to 35 mile an hour curves. The sun was pretty much done setting when we hit Bodega Bay, so we went out to the Doran Beach campground, paid our 15 bucks, and set up the tent in the waning light. Then we drank heavily, managing to hit AM Radio Gold coming up the coast from San Francisco, a local call-in sex advice show. San Francisco is a very sexually liberated place, not just in terms of orientation, but attitudes towards sex in general. The folks calling into the show were so committed to being open and accepting of other people's sex that it's giving them some real head-scratching questions. For example, I love my boyfriend, but could you recommend a polite way to tell him that I just don't want to pee on him? I don't want to hurt his feelings, but I just... I, I just just don't want to do that. No judgment, just a quiet, polite refusal to urinate on another person. And that's something that I really love about how my generation approaches sex. In a post-internet age, sex is not very shocking, even weird sex isn't shocking. But that doesn't mean that everyone is having weird sex. Everybody getting to do their own thing means the average person will have average sex. But people who fall outside of that really don't catch much bullshit from other people about it. It's one of those rare egalitarian lessons that you actually can learn on the AM radio. When the show was over, it was cold, very cold. But I figured if I went through all the effort of setting up the goddamn tent, then I would sleep in it. That was very stupid. Stupid, stupid, oh my god was it stupid. I don't think I had ever woken up colder in my entire life. It's the kind of cold where moving sounds like the worst possible thing to ever happen to you, except for if you don't move, in which case the blood in your veins feels like it's gonna goddamn freeze solid. I would have shed a tear, but the sleep in the corners of my eyes were frozen, clogging the duct. It was light out, barely. I managed to get up and over to the trunk of the Mercury to find the cold weather jacket I'd brought. Jed knew what was up. I spotted him curled up in the back seat in his sleeping bag with a blanket on top. I figured in the meantime I'd take a walk on the beach to get my bearings, so I stepped out onto Doran Beach. And the beach at six in the morning is a weird thing. When it's cold, the sand feels so stiff and unyielding. When it's gray, it seems so hostile. When you lose that feeling of having fun in the sun, the ocean forces come through a lot clearer. The sounds, the textures, the birds. Sunny days at the beach are all about you. Cloudy mornings confront you with the immutable fact of the ocean. I headed down towards some kind of sculpture at the other end of the beach, looking at the tasteful but obviously expensive homes dotting the sea cliffs. Does anyone grow up in a place like this, or is it populated solely by people who have already made their fortunes? There are signs of vibrant life everywhere, even this early in the morning. How would it be to actually be part of this landscape every day? What do these motherfuckers do for the goddamn money, anyway? Unanswerable questions, at least to the scope of my knowledge. 
I contemplated the strange amalgamation of beach debris I'd spotted from the other end and headed back. I knocked on the window of the Mercury. Jed looked displeased. It was time for our third day on the road. The day was heavy and gray well into the late morning and afternoon, and it made for a more contemplative journey than the last couple of days. Driving with the windows down and the radio on, especially in a car like the Marquis, you're constantly drifting into the experience, pulled into the rhythms of the road and the music, and time passes with a confident steadiness. With a moody sky pressing in from above and the closed windows keeping the outside world at bay, you turn to conversation to keep you going. One of the great things about road trip conversation is that a lot of the pressure to have something meaningful to say is taken away. You're going to be in this car for a long time. You might as well talk about goddamn whatever the fuck. That goes for highbrow conversations as well as lowbrow conversations. In a hundred mile stretch, talking points can range all the way from speculation about the nature of the universe to graphic descriptions of the gnarliest dog shit you've ever had to pick up in person. In such a casual, unhurried way that you have time to use one subject to illuminate how you feel about the other. And don't think for a second that there isn't a philosophical angle somewhere to scooping up electric yellow dog diary in a crinkled 7-Eleven bag, even if it's only to illustrate your opinion of philosophy in general. Haven't you ever been to a party and things are great until some guy chimes in with some awful ten-minute lecture about some esoteric academic point? It's not necessarily that people don't want to talk about that highbrow shit, it's that you don't do it during beer time. It's hard to find a good time in daily life to discuss big idea stuff with other people because, more often than not, you end up sounding like kind of a jackass. These long trips give you a golden opportunity to do it in a casual way. You're both just bullshitting your way through hundreds of miles of grand, exciting countryside. You have the time. Why not? It's not just that a long road trip can change your perspective through the things you see. It can change your perspective because no one's going to really roll their eyes when you try to articulate what you think your perspective actually is. The clouds hung low enough to cover the treetops that crested the surrounding hills. Much farther towards the west, holes are torn through the cloud layer, letting patches of sun shine down on the reflective ocean. The coast never rises too far above the ocean, but high enough for tremendous dramatic emphasis. The road curves more gently than it had in earlier miles, letting you go fast and easy through a stunning but quietly welcoming land. It's a very long portion of Route 1, but it's also the most consistent. From Bodega Bay to Westport Beach, it's 129 miles of the most satisfying, moderately graded coastal switchbacks imaginable. The Mercury is a car that weighs close to 6,000 pounds, and if you take a look at the suspension, you'll find these massive coiled springs supporting the frame and thick hydraulic shocks cushioning the wheels. The physical sensation of that amount of weight arcing, even after 36 years, so gracefully and smoothly through the turns is unforgettable. A lot of people do this route in sports cars, pushing their skill and the engineering of their cars as far as they can, enjoying the power of horsepower and speed. It's not really what I value in a traveling car. Not many people appreciate the sensation of moving an incredibly heavy vehicle under high torque. You never go fast, but pushing the pedal down means something. You really feel the 7.5 liter fat blue engine under your hood defy all the expectations of nature to haul the steel palace you're in another mile down the road. Such a massive thing as a 73 Mercury Marquis should not move at all, let alone move with the authoritative, effortless, torquey power that it does, even decades after its time on the road should have ended. It's not power without cost, though. The massive engine topped by a four-barrel carburetor goes through about 20 gallons of gas every 260 miles or so. Modern cars that have fuel injection have their fuel and air mixed to a carefully metered amount and then puffed into the cylinder chamber to be ignited. Carbureted vehicles like this Mercury suck air through a massive throat at the top of the carb, then mix the air with fuel into a flammable mist that gets sucked into the cylinder when the piston goes down. It's tremendously imprecise and very mechanical. Your gas pedal is connected to a literal chain that yanks the throttle, increasing or decreasing how much fuel the carb is sucking in and making the car go faster and slower based on how far back the throttle is being pulled. Modern cars, they're so cleverly designed that they respond immediately to what the driver is doing. A new car will be like an extension of the driver him or herself. You push the pedal down, a computer adjusts the throttle for you, and the maximally efficient amount of gas is spread ever so precisely into the cylinder through many gears at high horsepower. Drive the Mercury, there's a delay as the machine responds at its own pace, like pulling the reins on of, a, of a horse. The Mercury is its own beast, not an appliance. You push the pedal down, you're flooding a cast iron furnace with aerosol explosives to make it go faster through a maximum of three gears, never topping about 200 horsepower. 
from a 7.5 liter engine. It's an impossibly different motoring experience. Truly, that is the difference. A new car will give you a very pure driving experience, but you'll never have quite the same physical sensation of true recreational motoring. At Westport Beach, Route 1 heads back east for its last brief stretch before rejoining US 101 at Leggett. It's a lovely few dozen miles through coastal forests, and after hundreds of miles of open sky, the closed-in feeling of the forest is just the change of pace we wanted. Right before the end of Route 1 is something we wouldn't have missed for the world, one of America's few drive-through trees, the chandelier tree. It's a redwood fat enough to have carved a passage to the middle of. We weren't sure if the mercury would fit, but the tree had been drive through since this size of car was more standard, so we figured it was probably worth the risk. We fit through with centimeters to spare. If we had had one more side mirror, we wouldn't have fit, but we did. And we were too immersed in the experience to take a picture of it, but it's worth well over the five dollars we paid to drive through a living thing that's been in California longer than white people have. We stopped in the gift shop at afterwards, although they seemed disinclined to let us drive through that as well. And in the shop I chose, as an adult, and of my own free will, to buy a fake coonskin cap. I figure, I'm sure as fuck not trying to impress anyone, this hat is hilarious, and this trip embodies the pioneer spirit more than anything I've ever done, so why not? I mean, there is a long list of reasons why not, but I did, and I wore it the rest of the trip, mostly. I'm not gonna defend it. But I did do it, and I did enjoy it. I'm not the only one who enjoys stupid looking shit along this next stretch of the US 101, however, and Jed and I were only minutes away from an encounter with one of the most classically kitschy roadside attractions left in the country, Confusion Hill Gravity House. There's a bridge that bypasses it now, and you have to deliberately exit the 101 to get to it. But at the time, it came as a tremendous surprise to come around a corner of Shadowy Forest Highway and be confronted by a totem pole of circus bears. In the language I speak, a totem pole of circus bears means stop the fucking car immediately and pay any sum to see what's up, so Jed and I find ourselves once again in a roadside environment designed to confuse and befuddle. Gravity houses are clever, but in an old-school way that doesn't really impress very many people anymore. They're built into a hillside and give the illusion of gravity run amok, people standing at unnatural angles, water running uphill, that sort of thing. It's pretty obviously a con, but it is a bit of an architectural mindfuck if you're willing to appreciate its folksy deceptions. Back on the 101, you head into the great redwood forests of Humboldt County. Redwoods are some of the largest living things on the planet, living hundreds of years and growing to tremendous heights and widths. Many redwood forests were cut down at the end of the 19th century, but it turns out that redwood is a pretty awful construction material. Once the word got out about it, the forests weren't worth very much money. So redwood forests are slightly better preserved than many of the other forests of old California. At exit 645, you can take a scenic detour that'll bring you up close and personal with these unique and charismatic wilderness spaces, the Avenue of the Giants. With the mid-afternoon sun filtered through the massive and ancient canopy of the redwoods, the drive was jaw-dropping. Forests are pretty much always beautiful, but the presence of these massive, soft-bark redwoods and the gorgeous interplay of light and shadow along the byway leaves an impression that will always be with me. It's well worth coming off the 101 for. US 101 is the only major through route servicing this area of California, so it's designed for a steady 55 mile an hour over cruise. Jed and I liked 65 about right for it, the curves are nice and easy and the straightaways last for long periods. The 101 has a lot of passing lanes for faster traffic, so while it's certainly very beautiful and pastoral, it's an opportunity for lead footing it a bit. But be sure you obey speed limits any time you get remotely near one of the many small towns along its route. They have patrolmen hiding in some pretty clever spots ready for your donation to the local economy. It's luck that Jed and I didn't get a speeding ticket, but Jed gives the impression of having some kind of natural telepathy about speed traps. He'll sniff one somehow and suddenly break, will round a curve, and sure enough there's a local boy in blue hiding in an overgrown driveway. It's easy to speed, and you'll really want to along the 101, but there are sharks in the water. The land along the 101 is lusher and greener than the majority of Route 1, however, and the cooler, wetter climate gives rise to incredibly dense foliage that lines the road no matter where you look. We reconnect with the ocean at Eureka, pull some slow miles through surprisingly built-up coastal towns, and then spot another promising roadside monument. The enormous Paul Bunyan and Babe the Big Blue Ox statues that sit outside the trees of mystery. 
but we're too late. It's closed for the day. These trees of mystery will forever remain mysterious to me, and maybe it's better that way. The mysteries I imagine those trees to hold are probably going to exceed a reality that costs eight dollars. Towards evening, we arrive at Crescent City, where we stop for gas and prepare to depart from the coast route we followed for 977 miles to head inland, crossing northeast into Oregon, heading for Crater Lake. We split off onto US-199 and pass between deeper, taller, rockier mountains than we'd yet seen on the trip. The sun had already passed behind the peaks, and the deep orange light slowly retreated up the stone edifices that towered above the road as we wound our way towards our first next state. And while they certainly didn't plan it that way, US-199 emerges from the mountain passes almost the exact mile you transition between California and Oregon. Seeing the Welcome to Oregon sign is a big moment. Nowhere else in the US, except perhaps Texas, could we have driven so far in one direction without crossing a state line by now. It was mostly dark by the time we stopped to eat in Grants Pass. Should we press on in the dark, or what? We would be backtracking to the coast later on, so we figured, fuck it, let's hit the road again and get to the National Park at about one in the morning. We then run into Interstate 5 again, all the way up here, but leading right back down to exactly where we started if we were to follow it all the way. And we followed the I-5 southbound for a short stretch before cutting east on Route 234 and then north on Route 62. No one drives these lonely byways at night, so we had the freedom of privacy and speed as we cruised further and further into the mountains that hold Crater Lake. In the Mercury, you activate the high beams with a big button down by your left foot. You tap it with your toe, and the brights come on with a satisfying clack. The way the four headlights illuminate the trees in a cone of white clarity while everything recedes into the fog of darkness, the radio blaring, the motor softly turning along, it's a mesmerizing thing. Then, a little after where Route 230 breaks off Route 62, with us sticking along the 62, we were plunged into darkness. A second later, the headlights were on again, then they weren't, then they were. Jed stops the car in its tracks. The goddamn bastard high beam lights had a loose connection. Nothing obvious, nothing we could fix right then. But the regular headlights worked without incident, so a dimmer drive would have to suffice. The drive took a long time, longer than expected, but the booth where you'd pay to get into the National Park was closed, with the entrance left open. Our tardiness had given us a reprieve from the fees, so we pulled around to the visitor center. All the campsites were marked full, the visitor center parking lot was open. The math here was plain. A little wooden nature trail led into the trees, soft dim lights illuminating the boardwalk. We would have our beers here tonight, quietly, among the trees, 6,000 feet above the ocean we had been driving along for days. We woke up to a full parking lot, completely undisturbed, with no hassling from the park rangers. And that wasn't the only bit of luck. We were parked right next to a building with coin-operated showers, our first flirtation with cleanliness since we left San Diego. When you're out on the road and you're not trying to impress anybody, you can keep on going for quite a while until your own musk overwhelms you. We weren't at that point yet, but we could see it from there. A hot shower after a four-day wait for one is a genuine spiritual experience. A small one, but a genuine one. Your whole being made new with the removal of several pounds of dust and grease. It was an excellent way to start off the day, not to mention already being at our next major destination. We slowly climbed the road to the rim of Crater Lake, and when we got there, our jaws just dropped. The natural spectacle of Crater Lake is unparalleled. It's a thing that's truly unique in the world. The road leads all the way around the rim, offering fantastic views of not just the lake, but of the surrounding mountain landscape. On the first leg of the route around the rim, the surrounding land falls off dramatically, a tremendous gulf of sky between you and the places you've passed through to get here. But as the drive moves around its circuit, the land becomes like a gently rolling plain, with great rocky mounds busting up through the low grasses like stone tumors. It's as if we were driving on Oregon's roof. We knew that all around us was sky, and yet here these great solid masses jut out ambitiously away from the earth that bore them. And in the middle, a lake of otherworldly beauty. It's the second deepest lake in all of North America, and it goes straight down. The water is some of the purest in North America, too, and in combination, these two things give Crater Lake its finishing touch. When the light hits it fully, Crater Lake becomes a blue so vibrant and electric it's practically neon. A boat tour of the lake itself is available for a pretty steep fee, but Jed and I figured it would be more than worth it to see this natural wonder right up close. To get to the actual lake, you must descend a switchbacking trail that's the equivalent of 150 flights of stairs. Why so damn steep? 
Well, Crater Lake lives up to its name. It is a genuine crater, created after Mount Mazama erupted so violently that its entire peak caved in on itself, after 12 cubic miles of rock and ash were spat out across the northwest. As time progressed, the caldera cooled and filled with water. At this altitude, in this climate, so much water that scientists say that the lake evaporates and refills itself completely every 250 years. Lingering volcanic activity pushed up a new cinder cone from the lake bottom, Wizard Island, as seen in these pictures. The eruption took place an estimated 7,700 years ago, very recently from a geologic standpoint, and even recent enough to have been witnessed by the native peoples of the region and passed down through their mythology. The ancient locals tell of two gods locked in struggle, how they, quote, hurled red-hot rocks as large as hills, they made the earth tremble and caused great landslides of fire. Which is pretty much exactly how a volcanic eruption goes down. The Oregonians of present know that better than most, having experienced the, the eruption of Mount St. Helens just over the border in southern Washington, a mountain that's part of the same volcanic chain as Mount Mazama. Crater Lake was sacred to the people of the region for thousands of years afterwards, and how could it not be? This is a place of impossible beauty that could only have been created through some of the most spectacular violence that our world is capable of producing. Violence that even a modern nuclear-powered America could barely match. It's a story that would be worth telling for 7,000 years in a row, especially when it's illustrated so boldly upon the land itself. When I think of American history, I tend to think of the history of Americans, but the world is much older than even the words I'm using to describe it, and the experiences of the people who saw it firsthand, who witnessed the natural world in ways my eyes could never truly perceive, their stories are almost all gone. The story of Americans is of a free and bold people, moving industriously and with purpose to conquer a grand frontier of savage wilderness. It's a story we've told for 300 years or more, but it's a story that's built on the bones of the uncounted dead who lived in these spaces for millennia. People who left few physical monuments but passed down the truth of themselves through community and storytelling, generation after generation. Their legacy is in their persistence, but these truths aren't remotely relevant to the experience of being an American in the individualistic, history-smashing way we enjoy going about it. Better to think of America the continent as an untouched frontier, wrapped up just for us with a big red bow, than as an ancient, vast space that we've just commodified. The argument can and will be made that we've accomplished more with the land in 300 years than the first peoples did in 3,000. But if you're going to argue about it that way, I want to touch on the common idea of North America as a kind of Eden. I'm not a big fan of the Bible. I think the idea of God is pretty ridiculous. But some things in the Bible are uncommonly prescient, and the story of exile from Eden is one of its greatest hits. Now, so little of the first people of America remain today because they didn't seek to change the land like modern Americans are eager to do. Don't think I'm implying that they were some fantasy people living in perfect harmony and happiness. They were clever folks, they had tools and culture and technology, and they also had the whole range of human problems that stem from universal human failings like greed and avarice. There was nothing to stop them from dominating the land like the Europeans did. They could have begun that process at any time, but they chose not to. The relationship that they had to the place that they lived was personal. They would not re inflict the wounds that human progress, progress as I would name it, inflicts. In Genesis, in the Bible, God tells Adam not to eat from the tree of knowledge. He must not reach beyond his station as one of God's creatures, not break the balance between him and the garden. But he and Eve choose to rise ab above their natural order, to possess the knowledge of themselves apart from the land. As a consequence, the garden would be forever closed to all of mankind. For the people who told the story of the Garden of Eden, the people close to the roots of Western civilization, that's always been true. We never have been able to return to Eden. It is lost to us forever. For the first peoples of America, the story of Adam and Eve was never true in the first place. They rarely sought to rise above their relationship to the land. When Europeans first came to America, there may have been a brief moment where a change of perspective was possible, where we might have learned a little of the way back to Eden, but it certainly didn't pan out that way. And then we took Eden away from those who had been here since time immemorial, since clearly they hadn't done anything we would have considered meaningful with it. 
Comedian Louis C.K. has a great bit about why the term Indian is offensive. He points out that it started when early explorers didn't realize they had found a new continent and figured they must have come all the way around and hit India. Americans have known that the natives are not goddamn Indians for almost 400 years, but we give so little of a fuck about them that we have never bothered to correct the mistake. Louis is pretty on the money with that one. My ancestors just assumed that if we could go ahead and have all of North America, we should. And we did. And I've benefited my whole life from the genocide committed by earlier generations of Americans. What we've gained is a continent that was developed for use by humans at such a speed that if you compare America's growth to the slow rise of civilizations in past history, was almost instantaneous. A shake-and-bake empire, bold and loud and creative as anything ever seen before. America is beautiful in its ambition, and I mean that sincerely. The first journey across the entire United States by car was made in 1908. America hadn't even been traversed from one end to another by Westerners by foot until Lewis and Clark in 1806, a little less than a hundred years earlier. 163 years after Lewis and Clark, Americans would journey to the goddamn moon. The spirit of American civilization is so charismatic, so infectiously proud, so committed to feverishly pushing the boundaries of what's possible, that I'll never be able to see it as a wholly negative thing. I love it too much. But what we lost was thousands of years of human experience, and a way of living that values balance and the spiritual experience of being human over the conveniences of being human. It's not a flaming sword held by an angel that bars us from Eden. It's time. Time and the consequences of the choices our ancestors have made. I mean, it's the sort of shit you can't help but think about when you're sitting in a hot metal tour boat with tourists from all around the modern world, listening to a well-meaning park ranger try to boil down the complicated experience of being who we were in this place down to two talking points. And he was really fucking committed to just two talking points, things that are sacred and things that are sacrifices. Also, some geology that involved sacrifice on the part of the geologists. Do you see how he brought it around? He felt very clever about that one. It wasn't the least informative park ranger talk I'd ever had. At the Gila Cliff Dwellings in northwestern New Mexico, I once listened to a park ranger give a talk that was half actual anthropology about the people who built the dwellings and half first-person recounting of rituals he dreamed observing while tripping on mushrooms. A mushroom trip informed by the anthropological details of his professional life, granted, but a mushroom trip nonetheless. I'm dead serious, that happened to me, but as lacking in authoritative detail as that talk was, it was a hell of a lot more lively than the smirking condescension of our Crater Lake guide. But they could have replaced the guide with a live polka and I would have cared as much. The point of the boat trip is to experience this unforgettable, impossible place right up close, and I am damn glad that I did. We backtracked our way down what was left of Mount Mazama, seeing in the daylight what had before been just a corridor of trees. In the night, with a high-torque car like the Mercury, we had no real sense of the elevation gain we'd made. Now we did. The trip down the ancient volcano was a truly fantastic drive, the light, cheerful green of the Oregon woods spreading out across miles of gorgeous, vital countryside. Especially around Lost Creek Lake, it's pretty easy to say that Route 62 is one of the most relaxing drives in all of Oregon. And its pleasantness is all the more memorable when you consider the apocalyptic violence the land had endured just 7,000 years previous. Now, we were headed back to the coast. But we didn't want to miss too much of it, and didn't want to backtrack anything we'd driven in the daylight. The obvious choice would be Route 42 from Winston to just south of Coos Bay. But Jed and I had a better idea. We would take a shortcut. A thin gray line wildly switchbacking through completely undeveloped coastal mountains. No other roads for dozens of miles north or south. Hollywood has conditioned us to consider this a bad idea, but Hollywood hadn't gotten much right about what we'd seen of America so far. No, we would go all in on the thin gray squiggle to get us to the coast, and we were absolutely right to do so. The Bear Camp Coastal Route, National Forest Road 23, is one of a dying breed of American road, the one-lane mountain access route. It's paved, but it's not meant for RVs of any sort, and since it connects nothing in the middle of nowhere with nothing on the other side of nowhere, there's never enough traffic for having only one lane to be a problem. This sounds like a bunch of drawbacks, none of them are. Having a thinner road means they can build the road closer to the mountainside, switchbacking up tremendously steep grades, rewarding slow, methodical motor touring with unparalleled views of mountain wilderness few care to come and see. 
untouched, not because of its rarity, but because of its obscurity. We crested a hill and stopped a moment to find that, if we opened both front doors, we could look down and see nothing but sky on either side of the road. Choosing this route gave us a true thrill of exploration that's hard to match on a road trip, and it pays to reflect that in the days before the freeway system, much of travel in America was done this way, slowly, on underdeveloped roads through huge swaths of raw nature. But the thing that they don't tell you about driving 20 miles an hour is that you only go 20 miles in an hour. The journey is the point, and the exotic nature of the route was worth the time investment anyway you look at it, but it is a stark contrast to the California freeway mindset Jed and I grew up with. When National Forest Road 23 hits National Forest Road 33, the Agnes Road, you get a second lane and a gas station, signaling a return to the modern world. After a brief stop at the Agnes Combination General Store Gas Station and Motor Lodge, we encountered the Oregon coast at Gold Beach, where we rejoined US-101 for the remainder of our trip up the coast. By the time we got there, though, it was pretty much night out. We decided to drive until we saw signs for camping, which we did up at Coos Bay. We followed the signs for camping down a long road. A really goddamn long road. And then the pavement ends, but there's still a sign for camping. So we figure, all right, it's down the dirt road, but we're right next to the ocean. Is that sand? Jed asked. That's sand. You should stop. But we are stopped. Stuck in the motherfucking soft, cool sand of the Oregon coast. Stuck up to the frame, completely immobile. We try to stick boards under the rear wheels, but the mercury is sunk in too deep. So we call AAA, a kind of insurance association that specifically covers towing and travel emergencies. And they tell us that a truck will be there right away. Half an hour, they call back. I'm sorry, they begin, a bad sign, but no tow company will take their trucks onto the beach. Okay, I argue, but we're not on the beach. The paved road is less than 30 feet behind us. Right, she says. The beach. I ask to call the tow company myself. I argue with the dispatcher for close to 10 minutes, and he reluctantly, snidely agrees to send a driver out to do a, quote, assessment. When the driver shows up, he gets out of his tow truck, takes one look at us, and cracks the fuck up. Didn't get too far now, did ya? He cackles, but he just chains our bumper up and hauls us back onto the tarmac in 15 minutes flat. AAA foots the bill, no money down. Insurance is wonderful when it actually works immediately. The driver helpfully directs us to camping that'll actually do us some good, so we head out to the campground and decide to skip the hassle of a tent and just crash in the car. The sand debacle had been hilarious in parts, but a pretty major frustration in others. We were eager to pass out and then put some miles between us and Coos Bay. When we woke, we realized we were eager to be done with the coast in general. We had a beautiful day of driving ahead of us, but it would be the last day along the 101, and that evening we would arrive in Seattle. Both Jed and I had family there, so we intended to spend three days with our respective relatives and then reconvene. You can be wonderful friends with somebody, but there is no getting around the fact that five days in the same room with someone, even if the room moves from place to place, is a little rough. But the morning was beautiful, so any restlessness was mitigated by the spectacular views of the drive. The Oregon coast is a seaside paradise, sandy beaches, often with large sand dunes a little further back from the ocean, surrounded by the vivid greens of the Pacific Northwest. The 101 curves away from the ocean a few times, giving you a little taste of the Oregon interior. Tiny, charismatic towns, unpretentious industry, and sprawling farmland. Oregon's a wonderful state, with a really fun cultural vibe to it. It's the most rural of the northwestern states, if we're leaving off Idaho. But it's still very cultured, with even minuscule hamlets possessing a bookstore or two. A scenic detour took us away from the 101 for a time, Route 131 around Camp Cape Mears and Tillamook Bay. It's true seaside travel, great boulders thrust up out of the ocean, holdouts of extremely tough rock the ocean hasn't managed to eat away yet. The beach curves gracefully and delightfully, the sun, the sand, and the trees all seem to go on infinitely. Even the smell of the place is wonderful, salt and flowers and the occasional barbecue. At the end of Cape Mears, we ended up right at the very edge of the land, and that was a little humbling. I spend so much time hooked into digital shit in my own world that I forget the vastness of the real world sometimes. A place like this will remind you of the truth of things again. Then on to Tillamook. Tillamook offers free tours of the cheese factory at the center of town, but Jed's sister wasn't too much impressed by it when she went a few years previous to us, so we decided to just go ahead and press on. 
These next miles between Tillamook and Astoria at the top of Oregon are much more functional than scenic. Cannon Beach, Seaside, and Warrington all kind of chain together to form the sort of generic American sprawl that creeps across the landscape any time corporate money starts to flow freely into a community. But as you cross from Warrington to Astoria over a thin and delicate land bridge, a very dramatic approach, Astoria itself is lovely. But Jed and I just passed through. Astoria's most notable feature is its enormous bridge over one of the widest parts of the Columbia River. This bridge is about four miles long. Four miles! It begins by guiding you up a long ramp to the top of the incline on the Astoria side, where the bridge is actually pretty far up in the air, and then gradually takes you down close to the level of the river and spits you out again in southern Washington. Out of all the different ways I've crossed between states, the Astoria Bridge is still my favorite. The design of the bridge is rather elegant and unusual, intensified considerably by its sheer enormity. We kept following the 101 up through Chinook and Raymond, Washington, and while it seems strange that two states so close together would really look different on a natural scale, they do. The greens of the Washington forest are darker and wetter than those of Oregon's, and the forests look a little more ancient and menacing. There's something lively and something fun about nature in Oregon, but as you continue north, these forests become so much more primal and intimidating. Though that doesn't stop people from consuming the land, as thick and mysterious as these forests are, Jed and I continually drove past huge swatches of clear-cut devastation. Then, as late afternoon came down around us, we went eastbound out Route 12 and State Route 8 before finally reconnecting with Interstate 5 at Olympia. At last, the freeway, the simple thrill of uninhibited speed, were Californians. Of course we missed it. We were a little startled to pass almost every car on the road, however. We were only going 70 in a 65 zone. The traffic, by our estimate, should have been going at least 80 in the fast lane of Interstate 5. But Washington drivers believe in the speed limit, and during the entire dozens of miles long urban corridor of Olympia, Tacoma, Federal Way, and SeaTac, only one car passed us, a minivan with California plates. We arrived in Seattle just as the sun had set, the bronze light making the city look triumphant and gleaming in the distance. Jed and I would be there three days, but it wouldn't be a year later before I moved to Seattle for permanent. I'm not going to get into my downtime in Seattle, save to say that it was delightful and that I enjoyed it. Jed enjoyed time with his family as well, and after our vacation within a vacation, we were actually quite eager to hit the road again and see some landscapes we'd never really encountered before. The grand Olympian peaks of the North Cascade Mountains. We took Interstate 5 north towards the Canadian border and then split off onto Washington 20, another world-renowned scenic route. It doesn't start off too impressive, just Washington backwoods sprawl, which is a funny sight for someone from California. In San Diego or Los Angeles, urban sprawl just sits heavy and obvious across the entire landscape. Here in the Northwest, all the warehouses and fast food chains are hidden amongst the trees, peeking out in clumps from behind a veil of green. Sure, when it gets dense enough, the sprawl is more classic and suffocating, but mostly, out away from the rather compact urban centers of western Washington, even the most mundane things take on a certain soggy charisma. Within an hour from the interstate, the road starts gaining some very noticeable elevation. Gentler mountain chains would gain elevation gradually along with the road, climbing lazily skyward. The North Cascades are not gentle mountains. The peaks are too high, the slopes too steep for the road to even really approach them. Washington 20 winds through one of the few usable mountain passes, creeping through a valley many hundreds of feet below the actual ridge line. The North Cascades Park extends mostly north and south of the road. The portion that the 20 passes through is a very thin slice of the actual park. A park too wild to be tamed by motor traffic, and that's fine by me. Great American naturalist Edward Abbey and I might differ on the merits of motor touring, but we both agree that some spaces should remain forever wild, places so unique and beautiful that they should be protected from ourselves so that they'll be around for generations. You know, national parks. They're wonderful things with a wonderful purpose, and the one route that does push through the mountains up here, this road, is a drive through a countryside so dramatic and ineffably permanent seeming that it borders on the mystical. It's little wonder that so many early cultures, including the Greeks, thought that their gods lived on mountaintops. The road up here struggles yearly with being overtaken by the land it passes through as well. It's closed through the winter and much of the spring, and when it is open, it frequently suffers from rock slides, mud slides, and tremendous natural erosion from the yearly freeze-thaw of the pavement. Being in a, in a landscape like this gives a subtle sensation of trespassing on something much greater than yourself. The drive reaches its scenic climax around Diablo and Ross Lakes, gorgeous pools of blue surrounded by razor-sharp peaks in the dense growth of the forest. 
The road winds up and around the lakes, giving you excellent views any direction you look, and the road often passes by tiny waterfalls streaming out of the rock face when the lanes curve close to the mountain slope. Beyond the lake, the elevation goes up a bit more. I've driven the road a few times since this trip, but it's never been quite like this time in the Mercury, forests receding behind us, Jed holding the pedals steady against the floor, the giant sedans rocketing confidently up the passes while the radio serenades us with familiar guitars. It felt like a moment somehow displaced in time, stolen from the past so that the present can understand. After a dozen miles or so, the trees begin to thin out. The mountains become rockier and give the impression of balding. It heats up a bit. The mountains are tall enough that the moisture of western Washington doesn't pass over them very well, and as we travel down the other side of the mountain range, we will descend into the dry, hard scrabble counties of eastern Washington. At this elevation, and this close to the Cascades, there's still plenty of green, but not as lush, more spread out, more entrenched against the inevitable periods of drought. The drive down this side of the mountain pass is spectacular without the trees blocking the view. You see the whole massive curve of the road wind down thousands of feet of dry, rocky slope towards the Methow River and Winthrop. When you've finished your descent, you're met with gracefully decaying farmhouses, surrounded by low, rolling hills, covered in grasses and shrubs, with stands of trees popping up about as intermittently as the buildings do. But the further east you go, the drier it gets, and soon green fades to gold. It's not just the greenery that was giving out as we wound eastward on the 20 towards Omac. It was the Mercury. This car might not have ever left California in all its 36 years, and I'm pretty goddamn sure it hadn't done serious driving in at least a decade. And the North Cascades, well, the North Cascades are a lot to ask. Too much, it turned out. Jed seems tense. I ask him what's up. Well, we're not shifting gears right. It's sticking. Actually, it's sticking gears pretty badly. Automatic transmissions sense engine strain and move the gear up and down to accommodate. When it sticks, the engine is straining too long in a gear that's inappropriate. It'll stay in first when it should be in second, stay in second when it should be in third, and literally pop with an accompanying clank and shudder into the correct gear when it finally figures it out. This is, let's be clear, a big problem. But the C6 transmission of the Mercury is a fat, beastly piece of equipment. It was about to fail, but it hadn't failed yet. I asked Jed how many miles we have left. He figures probably less than 500. And 500 is actually a rather auspicious number for us. If we can limp our way across the flat, rolling, high desert of eastern Washington for just 150 more miles, we'd get to Spokane, where my uncle, cousins, and grandmother lived. We had been planning to stop anyway, but now with purpose. My uncle works on classic cars as a hobby and has a well-equipped garage. If we can make it there, we might salvage the trip. So really, what is there to do but move forward? The best route to Spokane also happened to have one of Washington's greatest engineering achievements right along the way at the bottom of Route 155 out of Omak, the Grand Coulee Dam. Completed in 1943, the dam is the largest electrical power producing facility in the entire United States. While the Hoover Dam is arguably more dramatic and impressive, the Grand Coulee surpasses it in production. And it really is a beautiful thing in itself, long and low, with such a bold technological confidence that it comes as a bit of a shock that the thing was built in the 40s. You could even say the 30s, as its principal design and construction occurred during that decade. Since 1989, they do laser shows at night across the cascading water coming down the dam face. Jed and I were just passing through, though, and we hoped to head to Spokane before night fell. It was lucky our transmission was giving out here in this flat and open country instead of halfway up the mountain. We took the 174 southeast out of Grand Coulee, miles and miles of farmland stretching out toward the horizon, the true eastern Washington experience. When we hit U.S. Route 2, we took it east and it ran us right into the heart of Spokane, a very impressive little metropolis right in the middle of the northern plain. But it wasn't time for tourism, it was time to brace for bad news. We rolled the Merc out to a transmission shop in Spokane Valley, the industrial side of Spokane. They specialized in truck transmissions, but we figured ours was a very common old Ford model and they might be able to give us a better estimate than a chain shop. And were we ever right, our transmission was shot, badly shot, and needed to be rebuilt. When he showed us the, the transmission pan, flakes of silver reflected back up at us from the bottom of the burnt orange darkness of the fluid. At Amco, America's most popular transmission chain place, they'd tell you $4,000 and the price would get higher from there. At a reasonable shop, they'd tell you $2,000. This was the first time in my life I ever experienced reverse sticker shock. Well, the graying mustachioed gentleman said, 
If you pull it out and put it back in yourself, we'll do it for 600 bucks, assuming your gears aren't fucked, and if you got all the way here from OMAC, I'm figuring they're not. But it's another 300 if you want us to take it out, and another 300 if you want us to put it back in. Well, shit. So, Jed and I worked for the rest of the afternoon through the night to pull out the transmission ourselves, using a set of Ford shop manuals for 79 Fords that my uncle had. The C6 was still used in 79s, so the procedure was mostly the same, and Jed knew enough to puzzle out the steps that didn't line up. I assisted where able, happy to help, but I didn't and don't know one-tenth of the shit that Jed does about cars. I will tell you what a weird sense of history you get, struggling to turn bolts that haven't been turned in twenty years or more, leaning all your weight into the socket wrench until you hear the squeak of the bolt coming free and the patter of rust and dirt you broke off falling to the concrete of the garage floor. It brings up questions of whether you can ever really own an object that's persisted in time for so long. I'm the one with it at the moment, but I haven't even seen ten percent of this car's life. I have no idea where it's been or who's done what with it. Cars are cultural objects, yes, but they're also deeply personal objects, and all of that personal significance is lost and begun again with each new owner. The Mercury has seen much, but it'll never tell, and the endless layers of steel, plastic, rust, and grease yield no answers, hold no clues. But we have a problem. There's only just enough room to get the transmission out from un under the car when we finally free it. How are we possibly going to hoist it back up in there? We need it to get put back in professionally, and $600 is all the money we've got left. If we fix the car, we'll be stuck anyway. My family decided to save our skins. My grandmother footed the bill for the transmission, and I'm always going to be grateful for that. She really saved the trip. I certainly didn't much deserve it, though I wasn't a very impressive person at that time in my life. If I had to characterize it, I'd probably call myself a jackass and a person in love with their own misery. But my family, not just my grandmother, but my whole family on all sides, saw the adventure and the value in what Jed and I were doing. They, for they could forgive what I was like at that time in the hopes that I wouldn't always be that way. And it took me a long time to see that, to see the patience involved on their part. I'm lucky for having had that. The transmission rebuild would take three days, then we'd be able to hit the road again. In the meantime, my cousin Josh, Jed, and I would spend a day or two at my aunt's cabin in nearby Spirit Lake, Idaho. Now, if you've been listening this far, you've probably been expecting me to say something about privilege in America. Well, I only offer this. Could someone be as big of a fuck-up as I was, as careless with money and self and others as I was, and still get to go on a boat trip in the country when my transmission goes out if there aren't some structural forces at work? If you really believe in American individualism, I ought to have been screwed. Instead, I got, quite undeservedly, another vacation within a vacation and a good-as-new transmission courtesy of Grandma. I'm grateful for the trip, for getting to take it, and for getting to finish it, but at no point is there any good reason why I specifically should have been the recipient of such good-hearted largesse. I ain't really that great. I've never been remotely so generous as a person as to have said, No, good grandmother, keep this money. Keep it, or give it to the orphans. I begged, she took pity on me, and I celebrated with a beautiful day on the lake. Spirit Lake is a real gem of the Idaho Panhandle, the northern narrow spur of the state that extends up between Washington and Montana. Spirit Lake is a town with three bars and one stoplight, some of the bars having been operating continuously for almost a hundred years. It was rainy the whole morning we headed out there in Josh's miniature Kia, rainy and gray up until mid-afternoon when the sun tore through the cloud layer and bathed the whole lake in sunlight. What a lake. On the map it looked small, but my aunt took Jed and I out on it in a remoter boat, and in person, it is impressively big. Everyone who owns property on the lake wants to keep it as natural and serene as, as is reasonable. Further out, the hills are dotted with these massive wooden glass cabin-slash-vacation mansions, and closer to the town center are the collections of regular cabins for regular folks. But everywhere there are trees, and everywhere there is life. Eagle nests sporadically appear among the trees, fish move deep under the boat, the calls of birds and animals come from every direction when my aunt lets off the boat's throttle and quiet descends again. I was blown away by the genuine splendor of it. I don't know what I expected from Idaho, but a paradise where you're allowed to smoke indoors is what I got. Out on the lake, I took some of my favorite photos of the trip and had some of my favorite memories. My aunt's a great storyteller, and so is Jed, and we had a hell of a lot of fun out there drinking beers on the water. It was great to have a relaxing day like that. Sometimes, having time to kill is just the ticket. Waiting gives you permission to go at an unhurried pace. Whatever you do, let it take time. And the freedom of that is liberating. 
Waiting around three days to get our transmission rebuilt sounds like a hassle, but it only would have been if I truly had nothing to do. Instead, I had a family to get to know and a lake to jump in. When work was wrapped up with the Marquis, my uncle, whose garage we'd been using and whose hospitality we'd also been enjoying, drove us back out to Spokane Valley to pick it up. We had one last lunch, then Jed and I were on the road again, what would be our thirteenth day of the journey and our seventh day of driving. My uncle's place is in North Spokane, a very spread out and rural suburb called Country Home Estates. From there, we took a back way out of Spokane and out of Washington State entirely, along Washington Route 290, which turned into Idaho Route 53 up through Rathdrum, after which we hooked into U.S. Route 95, heading north towards Sandpoint. The Idaho forests you'll drive along through this route are much drier than the kind of forests that are in western Washington, still very much alive, but with a kind of hard scrabble toughness that the damp and mysterious woods closer to the ocean lack. Human development is more obvious, too. The 95 is a pretty significant road for the area, and industry sits heavy on the landscape. Warehouses, truck stops, and box stores are as common as houses, maybe more so. But the character of the land still comes through. It's good that the Idaho panhandle is pretty remote as far as America goes, because it wouldn't take too much more population density to push the place over the edge from countryside to development. At said point, we cross over one of the larger lakes in the northwest, Lake Ponderay. Ponderay is a truly massive lake, 148 square miles of surface area, if Wikipedia is to be believed. And on a hot day like this one was, the temptation to pull over and jump into its cool sapphire depths was pretty strong, though not as strong as the thrill of breaking in a like-new transmission. With all new seals and gaskets, the transmission felt incredibly stiff, shifting exactly at certain RPMs, unerringly and jarringly. It would settle into a more natural feel within a couple thousand miles, but for now it was a little peculiar. We took Idaho Route 200 eastward out of Sandpoint, curving around the north bank of Ponderay, headed towards Montana. Montana would be perfect for breaking in the C6. Montana barely has speed limits. As a matter of fact, it didn't really have them at all prior to 1974. Instead, it had a law that any speed above what is, quote, reasonable and prudent is tickable. But there were no specific speed limits for a very long time, and the Montana speed limits, such as they are, are high, 70 miles an hour on rural byways. The reason for this is pretty obvious. Montana is huge, truly huge, on a Texas-like scale. Nobody would respect a 55 mile an hour speed limit. Life in Montana would take too long if you can't go freeway speeds in places where there aren't freeways. For our first few miles of Montana before we hit a passing lane, we discovered something funny about state driving habits. I'd mentioned before that people who live in Oregon and Washington are uncommonly compliant with speed limits. Well, we got stuck behind a car with Oregon plates who refused to go over 55 even though the limit now went up to 70. Jed and I imagined him deeply furrowing his brow. Oh no! Oh no no no! That is way too fast! You know, he may have gone through the whole state that way, provided he didn't get rear-ended by a pickup first. We moved around him at earliest opportunity, heading into a state that's earned its nickname, Big Sky Country. The Idaho Panhandle is thin enough that I didn't expect Montana to look much different from it, and for a while I was right. As we followed the 200, and it is still Route 200 in Montana as well, along the river leading southeast from Ponderay, the same rolling mountains coated in strands of bristly trees persisted. Beautiful country, to be sure, but the same sort of landscape that Spokane sits in. Sometimes, when you're out on a long rural route from nowhere to nowhere, you see the same car over and over again. We got into one of those situations. Four or five times we came up on this beat-up, forest green, 90s Lincoln town car with a couple local fellas behind the wheel. We figured nobody knows where the speed traps are better than Montana teenagers, so we cruise behind them for a couple hours as the 200 winds along the gorgeous river valley. The locals in the Lincoln figured 90 miles an hour was the right speed, so Jed and I settled into a nice 88 and let them take point. A speeder's best friend is another, slightly less cautious speeder. They'll be the first to hit the radar gun, the first to break if they see a cop up ahead, and since it doesn't take a lot of time to slow to 70 from 90, they're the ones more likely to get the ticket if you do get noticed by the local constabulary. Now, 90 miles an hour sounds like an excessive speed if you've never driven 90 miles an hour, but on freeways and long, open, rural byways like these, it's an amazing speed for cruising. Especially after Thompson Falls, the landscape shifts in an amazing way that just begs you to speed through it. The valley opens up into a grand vista of endless rolling mountains, too big to be hills, too softly rounded to be peaks. The texture of the land is like an unmade bed. It's unlike anywhere I've ever been. 
With everywhere we had been the rest of the drive, the visual focus was on the land, the oceans, the mountains, earthbound stuff. With these kinds of low, treeless mountains rolling out across the state, well, your focus is split about 50-50 between earth and sky. It feels strangely exposed, especially when you come up on a bigger town like Missoula. Missoula sits flatly on top of the landscape, feeling smaller than it is, dwarfed by the blue of the sky and the rim of mountaintops in every direction. Big sky country indeed. Oh, and if you hadn't remembered me mentioning it before, don't speed near towns or in towns. That's how they make the money. They're waiting for you. Even the gentleman in the Lincoln obeyed the speed limit in Missoula. It was getting towards evening when we hit Missoula, but after the unexpected delay of the transmission rebuild, we were eager to push the trip as far as we could that day. As the sun set, we wound our way down U.S. Route 93, through the idyllic valley surrounding the Bitterroot River towards Lost Trail Pass, a dramatic transition from Montana back into Idaho, the bulk of Idaho this time, having bypassed the length of the panhandle going through Montana. By the time we got there, it was pretty much all the way dark, but we snapped a few photos and kept on heading down the mountains towards Salmon, Idaho. What's really fascinating is that these exact mountain passes that Jed and I were happily driving through at an easy 55 miles an hour, drinking Dr. Pepper and eating Cheetos from a massive bag in the footwell, were the same mountain passes that nearly killed everyone on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Here's a small excerpt from when Lewis and Clark passed through this area 204 years earlier. Steep ascents, party fatigued and horses, horses slipped and rolled down steep hills which hurt them very much. The one which carried my desk and small trunk turned over and rolled down a mountain, broke the desk, the horse escaped and appeared but little hurt. We melted the snow to drink and cook our horse flesh. Cook our horse flesh. I wonder how many diamonds the AAA travel brochure would rate that. Idaho is hardly a tamed land, but at no other time in human history could, in just over 200 years, a person be able to traverse in a few hours' time, but before it took weeks and came at the expense of actual human lives. It was September when Lewis and Clark rolled through, and a winter hold up in the Bitter Roots would have killed them, all of them, for sure. But the local Nez Perce tribe built them canoes that allowed them to continue on by river, saving them. Do you think that the Nez Perce knew, on some level, that Lewis and Clark's expedition was the harbinger of their people's end? Westward expansion was inevitable. If they had let the expedition die, their fate might not have been much different. But it's a little shameful to reflect that their kindness may have hastened the inevitability. It's a complicated issue. A complicated issue that Jed and I would avoid by, one last time, getting impossibly drunk while car camping just south of Salmon, Idaho. Jed and I are believers in value, and we're not particular about our beers, which is a remarkably bad combination. If you lived a good life and been a good person, you probably haven't ever had a can of natural light. Allow me to explain it to you. You get 30 cans of natural light, natty light to its enthusiasts, for the price of 12 nice beers or 24 cheap beers. It typically works out to less than 50 cents a can for natty light. And you need all of those cans. Natty light is America's most utilitarian beverage. Once you crack one, you are going to sit there, you are going to drink all of them consecutively, and then you are going to go to sleep. That's the method. No one in their right mind would ever drink fewer than nine of these beers at once. Any less than the amount of drunk you get does not justify the horrible, horrifying experience of putting natural light in your body. The taste of Natty Light is best described as if a pet store janitor spilled a half gallon of pop-off across the shit-stained floor, mopped it up, threw a pack of Alka-Seltzers in the mop water, and then canned it for your enjoyment. Your first four beers in your set make your body think you're trying to kill it, but by the time you crack your fifth, the drunk's begun to settle in, and you're pretty good to go for the rest of the box. Jed and I got the 30-pack. Beers 12 to 15 I don't recall, but the great wall of cans we set up on the dash were all empty when we woke up. There's no waking up early when you drink like that. To be frank, you feel lucky waking up at all when natural light is in the picture. It was 10 or 11 in the morning and the car was getting too hot to sleep in, and that was a first for the trip. For the most part, it had been pleasant temperatures the entire trip, but it was roasting in there now. Out the windows, light filtered through the leaves of the trees and bounced off the multifaceted greenery all around the car. It seemed like the countryside had not changed much since we came over the pass last night. We were incredibly wrong. Perhaps we had known during the night that we were camped in some kind of oasis beside the Salmon River, but it sure came as a goddamn surprise to us now. Outside the patch of trees we were parked in, it was the high desert. A world of browns, beige, pops of faded red and turquoise. The West. Suddenly, very hungover, here we are in the American West. It took a moment for that to settle in. This part of Idaho had a resemblance to the rolling hills of Montana, but much drier and starker. 
As we cruised southward on US-93 towards Chalice, the same feel of exposure and thrill for speed persisted. This is an ancient-looking landscape, where the mountains are scraggly heaps of sharp, hard rock with the eroded dirt of the softer rock slumped around them, few plants able to gain foothold in the loose and hostile gravel. From Chalice, we would take another unusual shortcut, this time a 35-mile, one-lane dirt road leading along the northern edge of the land of the Yankee Fork State Park, State, road for, State Forest Road 70. It would climb up into the Sawtooth Mountains, gaining over 3,000 feet of elevation, and passing through two remote ghost towns, Custer and Bonanza. It would be about the most exotic driving we'd ever done in the Mercury. We asked Guy in a local auto parts store if cars could make it out the road. He said, probably, and yellow lights as good as a green light for Jed and I. We wound our way into the deep backwoods of Idaho, the clouds casting beautiful shadows across the raw and open land, but the hills were getting harder and harder to climb. Something's wrong with the Mercury again. Did we overwork the transmission too soon? No, says Jed. Listen. So I do. The rhythm of the engine is wrong. Instead of the steady churn the 460 usually rolls along with, you could hear a step of the beat missing, a misfiring cylinder. Without all eight cylinders firing in sequence, the engine can't deliver the power it needs to operate correctly. With one of them misfiring, you can limp along, but any more in your toast. It's bad news in any case. We were already deep in the middle of nowhere, however, and we certainly weren't going to go back down the mountain when we had come so far up it already. The decision became almost instantly regrettable when we encountered an incredibly steep, stupidly long incline. This thing had to be a quarter of a mile long. So we reversed to get a little bit of a head start. The engine only really felt weak once it was going uphill. On the little bit of flat we had leading up to the hill, we could gain a bit of speed. That speed lasts about a third of the way up the hill, then 30 slows to 25, then very quickly to 20, then to 10. Jed's got the pedal to the floor this whole time. The engine is howling in furious impotence. With an excruciating slowness, we creep further and further up the hill at 10 miles an hour. As we're almost at the top, it slows to 5. We let off the gas a little and then floor it again, hoping for a little boost, and we do get a little one. But as we're almost at the top, the Mercury finally stops moving, even though we're still at full throttle. Jed and I look at each other. We don't know what to say. We're afraid to move lest we slide on the dusty rocks all the way back down the motherfucking hill. Miraculously, we feel a subtle shift. Inch by inch, the Mercury moves forward again. Jed and I hold our breaths, remaining perfectly still. And then, we crest the hill, and the Marquis sickly wheezes its way along the one-lane path towards Custer. It was a triumph to make it up that fucker, one of my life's real triumphs, as arbitrary as that is. That slope was the only one like it, luckily, and while the Merc struggled with all the hills, we were never again in danger of sliding backwards down one. Here, up above the bald foothills, we're in the forest again. A very dusty forest, but a beautiful one. The road came along a stream running through the stoic pines, so we stopped a moment to cool the engine and take in the scenery a little. It was somewhat like the dry oak forests east of San Diego, but starker, leaner. It was bright and dry, and at this elevation wonderfully cool and breezy, it didn't bother us over much that the mercury was breaking down. The old bastard was going to do what it was going to do. And Jed and I didn't think it was done for yet. In the shop manuals we'd used to guide the transmission drop, one manual had a whole chart dedicated to diagnosing problems by sound, describing different noises and their possible causes and solutions in a big table. That's how cars used to be, flowing steel and plastic bound around a great cast iron furnace, diagnosable by sound and scent and touch. In a modern car with an aluminum engine and a computer controlled fuel injection system, we probably wouldn't have made it a little over a thousand miles with a bad cylinder. The balance of the systems is too delicate. With the Mercury, well, 50-50? And what choice did we have, really? We were already on the back half of our loop, bound for home. We would nurse the beast along as far as we could, and if we were lucky, San Diego would be within that range. Maybe you shouldn't beat a dead horse, but if you've got a sick horse, beating it to within inches of its life may be the only way to get it to move forward. That may seem grim, but Idaho backcountry brings that out in you. We wound our way along the road until we hit Custer, an abandoned mining town preserved as a museum. Mostly, ghost towns are either museums or heavily commercialized, trying to cash in on whatever enthusiasm for the Wild West lingers in American wallets. Our travel up the mountain had been harrowing and thrilling, a rare moment for us suburban kids. For the pioneers and miners who built this place and mined these peaks, was that thrill of putting oneself against the world part of their daily experience? I can't imagine it being otherwise. It takes a true spirit of adventure to think that this land is conquerable, and a true competence of living to make that ambition manifest. The American West is inspiring, and a little melancholy. The opportunity for that experience of life has disappeared along with the frontier, leaving little but these fragments hidden on the ragged fringes of America. 
Interestingly, we were about to have a surprise opportunity to see what replaced the miners after Custer Township went out of business in 1911. The gold dredge of the Yankee Fork, the massive floating factory machine that shimmied its way up this fork of the river for decades, not stopping production until the early 50s. It's a museum now, too, and you can walk deep inside its inner workings. The engineering of it is amazing. It's so rare to see technology this massive and this old, an extremely impressive kind of colossal industrial design that looks so foreign compared to how we conceive things to be these days. Gold dredges like this work by scooping up the riverbed in a huge 360 degree arc around the dredge, which floats on a barge. When a whole rotation of the river has been torn apart and sifted through, it moves upstream to the next untouched rotation and begins again. It slowly moved up the river for years this way. Of course, one of the reasons they don't mind this way much anymore is that it is incredibly destructive. It pretty much destroys the entire river one piece at a time. But the materials that made the country had to come from somewhere, and for many, many years they came this way. Two massive inline-six diesel engines power the barge. You can see in the photos how the cylinders are larger than goddamn trash barrels. The pistons inside must, must be bigger than crockpots. Mufflers taller than a man tried to control the noise of those explosions. A museum guide told us that they still fire up the engines a couple times a year so that the engines don't seize, but that it takes days of preparation and dozens of gallons of diesel fuel to make the dredge live again, and supposedly the noise is deafening. Inspired, we decided to troubleshoot the mercury a bit. We examined all the spark plugs for a fouled one, which would be the luckiest cause of a misfire, the cheapest anyway. The worst would be a total loss of compression in one of the cylinders. Jed and I knew from compression tests done during shop class that summer that the number three cylinder was weak. The engine was pretty toast altogether if that ended up being the cause. Turned out later, luckily, that we were wrong about the spark plugs checking out okay. One of them was the culprit, but under the Idaho sun they all looked equally dirty and worn. To continue southward, we would putter our way along Idaho Route 75 through the Sawtooth National Recreation Area. I regret that the Marquis was giving us such problems through this region, because it's got a unique beauty to it that I've never seen anything quite like. As the 75 winds through the valley of the Sawtooths between Stanley and Galena, you're 8,000 feet above sea level. That's a tremendous elevation. You'd have to go all the way out to Colorado and the Rockies to find roads built higher up on the mountains than Route 75. It looks it, too. The climate is wet and cool enough to allow for a pro proliferation of wonderful low-growing plant life, but not too many trees. The trees sit together in thick clumps at the margins of the valley. The land makes it clear that this is about as high as you get that's still habitable for a lot of life. As you get further up in elevation, oxygen content in the air goes down. It's actually such a demonstrable problem that old carbureted vehicles like the Marquis that were regularly driven at these altitudes would have to have their air fuel mixture specifically adjusted to compensate for the lack of oxygen, oxygen that the car needs to combust its gasoline. Too little, and the explosion is weak which the Mercury was having to deal with in addition to the misfiring cylinder, a difficult drive through a truly remote landscape. Despite all of this, Jed and I were having a blast. The Sawtooths are incredible. You'll recall that I said driving atop Mount Mazama in Oregon was like driving on the roof of the state. Somehow vaguely forbidden and strange. Well, that feeling manifested here as well. When we passed through Gal the Galena summit, we snapped this photo and hit the highest elevation of the whole trip, 8,990 feet above the ocean we had spent so many days along. At the summit, we contemplated the Sawtooths for a final brief moment and then onward to home. Maybe not quite. I wanted to chain in one last scenic destination, but it was not to be. All my adult life, for reasons not entirely clear to me, I've been trying to see Craters of the Moon National Monument, a huge volcanic plain of torn and jagged rocks, a truly broken and shattered place, an exotic burning field of sharp gray rocks in the middle of the southern Idaho desert. I'd had two previous attempts to see it fall through. I so badly wanted this to be the time. We reconnected with US Route 93, the road we had been on before our remarkable little detour at Cary, and drove that eastward a couple dozen miles across the flat and arid land towards Craters of the Moon. When we did make it to the entrance, though, it's evening. Late evening. Even if we did the loop drive at the park, it would be too dark to see the majority of it. Great chunks of black volcanic rock poked up from between the dry grasses. I wanted so bad to see it. As you get deeper into the park, supposedly the landscape gets stranger and stranger, but we had to make an executive decision. We'd driven about 275 miles that day to get here. The mercury was breaking down pretty tough. We were almost out of money. What now? Well, maybe it was time to just go home. We had been meandering across the land, carefree and going slowly, sometimes anyway. 
But Nevada is not a fun state to drive across in the autumn heat, so if we pushed through and drove all night, it wasn't inconceivable that we'd reach San Diego by tomorrow afternoon. The most direct route from where we were to Southern California would even hit two scenic destinations towards morning. With luck, we'd hit them soon after dawn. We had about 950 miles between us and home. The top level of AAA roadside service offers a free tow of up to 200 miles if you break down, so really, we just had to make it 750 miles without the Mercury severing its final death, and we'd be golden. Ambitious, but possible. Jed pilots the marquee down US-93 through Twin Falls to the border between Idaho and Nevada at Jackpot. You can tell when he hit Nevada, they build a casino centimeters away from the state line, flashing their dancing neon come-ons into the warm desert night. We gas up in Jackpot, then I take the wheel and prepare for an all-night burnout through the entire state of Nevada. Jed fell asleep pretty early on, hung over and exhausted, but I got a little bottle of caffeine pills called Nodos. Each pill has two or three times the caffeine of a cup of coffee, so I started with three and took one every couple of hours thereafter. I actually love this kind of long-haul driving, especially at night. It's such an amazing feeling of mystery and exploration. Who knows, beyond the rocks and dirt at the edge of the headlights reach, what's really out there? There's nothing but the hypnotizing, inescapable pull of the highway to keep you going, but that's enough, more than enough. These roads are some of the least traveled in the whole country. At two in the morning, three in the morning, they are desolately empty. I drove hours at a time without seeing another vehicle on the road. From Jackpot, I take US 93 south all the way to Eli, then US Route 6 a couple hundred miles southwest to Tonopah. It was nearly dawn at Tonopah, and as I took US-95 south from there, the sun began to shoot out across the seemingly infinite expanse of the Nevada desert. I snapped this shot of Jed snoring his way down US-95 at around 7 in the morning, just as we were coming up on our route's next juncture at Beatty. Here we would take a ride onto State Route 374, and a little less than five miles outside of a town, we would hit the most obscure destination of the trip the ghost town of Rhyolite, with the extremely peculiar Goldwell Open Air Museum out front. Now, the Goldwell Museum isn't a history museum, it's a sculpture gallery, mostly of Belgian artists, who felt freed by this harsh landscape to make whatever was in their hearts. And what was in their hearts was pretty goddamn weird. Goldwell is surreal, genuinely and truly surreal. Consider this quote-unquote portrait of pioneer miner Shorty Harris along with a penguin companion. Or this ghostly interpretation of The Last Supper, a cliché of high culture completely displaced in time and continent, presiding over the uncaring desert. Or how about the most recognizable work of Goldwell, Hugo Herrmann's cinderblock Venus of Nevada. The little cube of blonde pubic hair cracks me up every time I see it. Now maybe I'm supposed to be taking some grander meaning than amused whimsy away from the Venus of Nevada, but I don't. It's a hilarious sculpture in a bizarre place. Smaller sculptures dot the hillside of Goldwell. If you decide to visit, take the time to really poke your nose around. The ghost town of Rhyolite is particularly remarkable. I talked earlier about how ghost towns are usually museums or tourist traps. Well, Rhyolite is one of the few that falls in neither category. Rhyolite is just flat out forgotten, quietly decaying in the powerful sun. It began as a mining town in 1904, but the mine ore ran out around 1910, and by 1916, the electricity was turned off and the power lines removed. By 1920, only one person still lived in the town, and when he died in 1924, Rylide became a ghost town permanently. In vast desert spaces like this, it's cheaper to just walk away from things than to tear them down, so here it stays. It's really amazing to see a town on the tail end of fading away entirely. Only the strongest walls of the strongest buildings remain, but the lack of moisture in the environment means that they'll be preserved for a very long time. Rhyolite's pretty far away from anything truly valuable, anything worth developing. The modern world will find Rhyolite one day, but there's no indication then that that'll be any day soon. Only one challenge remained, Death Valley, California. We would have to pass from 4,000 feet up around Rhyolite all the way down to sea level on the valley floor, and then climb 4,000 feet back up again when we hit the other side of the valley. We had made the route decision in haste, not considering having to climb out of the valley once we'd passed through. If we had been using our brains, or had a topographical map, which indicates elevation, it would have been obvious, but it wasn't until halfway down the mountain into America's hottest desert place that we realized that getting back up out of the valley was going to suck pretty bad. Once on the valley floor, we stopped a couple miles past the sea level elevation marker to get a gallon of water from the National Park Run General Store up here along County Route 190, and then we began the slow climb 4,956 feet up to Town Pass to exit the valley. 
It's a good thing that it was around 10 in the morning and not many people were trying to leave the valley because we weren't able to coax the mercury above 15 miles an hour most of the way out of Death Valley. Despite the earliness of the hour, we still accumulated chains of angry, hunk honking drivers impatiently waiting for the next passing lanes so they can get around these two fucking jackasses in a beat-up mercury. Wasn't much we could do about it, though, if we stopped going forward on the hills and pulled over to let others pass. There was no guarantee that we would be able to keep going up the hill at all. And we backed ourselves into a corner with that one, passing through Death Valley. But we did make it, and then a few dozen miles of flat desert travel along County Route 178 before finally rejoining a road that was familiar to us, the mighty U.S. Route 395 at Inukern. We took the 395 south to Interstate 15 and then to home. The exit to Judd's house was right off of Interstate 15, if the Mercury didn't crap out on us at the very last moment. It didn't. The Interstate is designed for speed, and all of its inclines were gentle enough that we managed to keep the beast between 50 and 75 miles an hour all the way home. We parked it right where we began, 15 days and over 4,000 miles earlier. We had done it. Jesus fucking Christ on a cracker, we had actually goddamn done it. After the trip, I spent another few months in San Diego before moving to Seattle for permanent on New Year's 2010. I figured, new decade, new city, new life. I brought the Mercury with me, and that one-way trip was pretty much the last adventure the Merc and I would have together. In December of that year, the Mercury slid off the road during a snowstorm and cracked its exhaust manifold on the sidewalk. I couldn't find another, so I sold the ancient thing. I often wonder if it's still out there, angrily puttering down the road, but I honestly don't think that that's likely. Jed still lives in San Diego, having gotten a job managing a small appliance repair shop specializing in sewing machines and vacuum cleaners. Jed first got the job because he's one of a steadily decreasing number of people who actually know how to rebuild lawnmower carburetors. As for me, I haven't yet done much with my life that anybody would find very impressive. On paper, I'm a financially unreliable high school dropout with some college experience, no degree, and six years experience in unskilled food service. Just another American nobody, really. How I've actually lived my life is a hell of a lot different, though. I've got an amazing thing going, a life that's better than I ever thought I'd have for myself. I live with someone I love, I got great pets, I got enough money for food, sometimes even enough money to have some fun on the side. I'll get a degree eventually. To work full time, I'm only taking one class at a time, so it'll be until my 30s before anybody takes me seriously as a professional. But I've already found happiness, and if it wasn't for what I learned in my time driving 70s Fords, I might not have found it. These Fords taught me the beauty of folly, of engaging with the world on the world's terms, and of what it means to be part of a very new country in a very old place. They taught me faith, a practical, whimsical kind of faith. I remember when I did drop out of high school, the vice principal, who was a serious man with a serious mustache, told me, You know, if you sign that paper, you're throwing your whole life away. What bullshit. If I had gone to college right out of high school, I wouldn't have learned anything. I had to find a reason to be part of society before it was something I wanted to do. Some people find that reason in money, some people find that reason in God, I found that reason behind the wheel of a 1973 Mercury Marquis. That's what a road trip should do if you're doing it right. Tear your comfort zone so wide open that it heals up differently and makes you a larger person for having done the thing. Before the trip, my dad asked me, why are you wasting so much money on this? I told him I was buying memories for myself. No way a responsible adult would buy a 6,000 pound, 19 and a half foot long sedan that gets 9 miles to the gallon. But how often does a responsible adult at daydream about it? Stupidity, grand exotic stupidity like this trip, has a powerful draw. Why fight it? Why settle for listening to my story about it? Could be you, you know, out on the road, foot on the pedal, hard on your sleeve. All it takes is a willingness to do the stupid thing. Building on up the road. Brother on up, 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 brother on up. Up the road. This may have the hard nose. It hard Just man.